So we come to this uh, a message today to think about this truth, the generosity of God and how it impacts upon us. And as we were thinking about that, I was just thinking about that, I was thinking about the joy that we're called to live in. And I was thinking about that picture of a person who's giving uh, joyfully, giving cheerfully. I remember Pastor Paul, I don't know, Paul, if you can remember, but you used to always share that verse and you always used to point to the Greek about how the word there is, is sort of similar to the English word and from which the, we get the English word hilarious, a hilarious giver. <coughs> and I always thought about that. Somebody who is just exuberant and, and just living out the generosity, reflecting the generosity of God. This is, this is where joy comes from. I was thinking about joy and I was thinking, you know, about, as I was thinking about giving and I was thinking about uh, this theme for this message today, I thought, you know, the real theme is joy. The joy that is reciprocated when we give. God takes joy in us. We are a joy to him. You are a joy to him. You are a rich and glorious inheritance, it tells us in God's word. And as I think about that, I think about joy as being something that is reciprocated, something that comes to us when we give. Well, I was thinking about joy from the world, and I was, I was Googling, well, what is joy? And actually, this, this uh, thing on the screen, if you Google, uh, if you're in, in the education business and you look at resources, there's uh, government worksheets on joy, interesting definition of joy. The joy that's spoken of there is a, a positive, pleasurable feeling, a happiness, something that's derived from uh, having everything content, having everything, you know, receiving a, a, a generous gift, um, being around people that love you. And there's a, a, a definition there of joy that I thought was really quite interesting, the way the world sees joy. You notice something about all of those definitions on the screen. You notice that they are all about our circumstances aligning. Our circumstances aligning with what we want. And so we're happy when the happenings around us happen the way we want them to happen. But as soon as the circumstances of our life don't align with our desires and our expectations, our joy goes out the window. And instead, there's despair, there's frustration, there's resentment, there's all kinds of things that come. See, the world has a definition of joy which is very different from what the Bible defines joy to be. And I want us just to have a little look at this. What is the definition of joy in the Bible? You know, the Bible speaks about a different kind of joy. And if you turn in the Scriptures and have a look there at what the Scriptures tell us, it tells us that Jesus prayed that we would have a joy in John 17, he prayed for us that we would have joy. And the joy that he prays for is that the joy of him himself would be fulfilled in us. Jesus' own joy. The joy that Jesus has as the perfect son of God living in fellowship with him. And he prayed for you and he prayed for me that we would enter into the joy that he had, that his joy that he had would be fulfilled in us. Where does this joy come from? You know, joy comes from, it, it, it comes from God. It's sourced in God, real joy, true joy. And Christians uh, understand that joy is not dependent and derived from our circumstances. It's actually derived from being filled with God's spirit. If you have a look in Galatians 5 and verse 22, it tells us this. It says, the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, and so on, faithfulness. It tells us that the fruit of the spirit is joy. The Holy Spirit, the fruit of being filled with the Holy Spirit, is a joy, a joy that transcends circumstances, 
It's not dependent on what happens in our life. It depends on who is in our life. And that's the wonderful thing about joy, that true joy that God gives. The joy of God is from God himself. That's where it comes from. I want you to notice something in this verse. This is a wonderful verse. If you look in Psalm 16, verse 11, this is a verse that's worth taking a little bit of time to think about. There are three statements in this, in this uh, psalm. It says, uh, For in your presence is fullness of joy. The presence of God, being in the presence of God, being in fellowship with God, being at one with him. And there was a time where God was like a fairy tale to me and I didn't know the presence of God at all. In fact, I remember uh, as a, a kid growing up occasionally in the Church of England, C of E, we used to go to church. Uh, the C stands for Christmas, the E stands for Easter, C of E. That's about how frequently we went to church. And I'd sit in church and I'd look out the stained glass windows and see all of the trees moving, wishing I was out there. And as I looked at the cloudy picture through the stained glass windows there is a picture really of the veil that stood between me and God God was a fairy tale to me God was like some kind of cosmic father Christmas that people would look to to maybe realize and align their circumstances uh, with with their aspirations and they saw God as a, a crutch that weak-minded people depended on and, and certainly, God wasn't real to me. I didn't know anything of being in the presence of God. God was behind a long way away, behind a veil. But I want you to notice in uh, Psalm 16, in verse 11, you will show me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. See, we were created to have fellowship with God. And the reason that Jesus came as we've celebrated around the Lord's table was to give himself. It says, for Christ also once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God. To bring us into the presence of God. And so he prays that we would have his joy fulfilled in himself in John 13 because he wants us to experience the same fellowship and union with God that he himself lived in constantly. And so this is what the real joy, uh, what real joy is. It's the presence of God. It's knowing God. Uh, you know, and this is, this is the wonderful, this is the path of life. This is what real life is. This is where uh, joy and fulfillment reside, is in the presence of God. And in great generosity, as we've celebrated today, God gave his son in order to bring us into that kind of a relationship. You know, there's a, a great verse um, here in, in the scriptures. It tells us that God, the joy that comes from God himself uh, is, is through the presence of God within us, within us. Um, and, you know, this is the thing that fulfills us. This is the thing that makes life work. This is the thing that, that is a delight for us. You know, the, the psalmist wrote in Psalm 73, who do I have in heaven? Who do I have in heaven but you? And there is none on earth, there is nothing on earth that I desire besides you. And if you look in that psalm in, in verse 73, he thinks about things that can go wrong in his life. He says, well, you know, when my flesh fails, in that verse it talks about our flesh failing. Psalm 73 and verse 26, my flesh may fail. Physically, you might be sick. You might be ill. The older we get, the more bits start to not work properly. You know, the more we start to have aches and pains. Uh, we, you know, life all of a sudden loses its vigor and its zest. He says, when my flesh fails, 
And some of you know what that means, what that's like, what that really means for us is, as our flesh fails. He says, when my flesh fails, when my heart fails, when life actually deals me such a tragedy that my heart breaks. Now, some of you here today know what it is to have a broken heart. And some of you probably are sitting there in your seats today and you're carrying a burden because of a heart that has failed. Life has let you down. Your circumstances don't align with what you long for. Certainly, Marg and I would say that's true for us. But this, this wonderful truth is, who do I have in heaven but you? And there is nothing on earth, there's nothing, no magic wand I could wave that would change the circumstances that I need to be fulfilled. Who do I have in heaven but you? And there's nothing on earth I need or desire beside you. He says, when my flesh fails, when my health fails, when when emotionally my life is is at its lowest point, look what he says. He says, you, you God, you are the one who is the strength of my heart. You are the one who is my portion forever. You know, that's something that I learned as a young 19-year-old when my mother died. And everything in my life crashed. Every circumstance, my studies failed. Um, I would be woken in the night with dreams. Uh, There there was a a, a tragedy. I was involved in Christian things and everything I touched was just failing. But I can say that this psalm became alive to me. This verse became a challenge to me because God is enough for me. God himself is enough for God's people. And that is a really wonderful truth to know, that God himself is enough. Your joy is found when we set our affections on God, when we set our affections on him. I want you to look at what the scriptures say there. A wonderful, wonderful verse in uh, 1 Peter. And this speaks of suffering, it speaks of tragedy, it speaks of difficulty. In 1 Peter, he says this, the trial of your faith. You know, God allows our faith to be trialed. You might be here today and you might think, I became a Christian, I expected God, you know, to give me a wonderful plan for for my life and things have gone pear-shaped. This is not what I signed up for. I expected that, you know, the idea was that Jesus was going to bear the man of sorrows, he was going to bear all my sorrows, and all I was going to get was get all the joy. But that's not the way it works out. Look in 1 Peter and see what it tells us here in verse 7, 1 Peter 1, 7. It says this, that it, in this you, verse 6, in this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, You're being grieved by various trials so that the genuineness of your faith, the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it's tested by fire, may be found to praise and honour and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen, you love. And though now you do not see him, yet believing, you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory. You know, this is a wonderful thing, you know, what we don't see. We don't walk by sight, we walk by faith. We walk in the light of the unseen truths about God. And one of the realities of God is his generosity and his love for us, his commitment to us, his unfailing love. His chesed. The Bible speaks of the chesed of God, which is the unfailing, steadfast, covenant love that God has for those who are his. It says, your loving kindness, your chesed, your steadfast, loyal love extends to the heavens. Your faithfulness reaches to the skies. And people who are anchored in the reality, that unseen reality of the love of God, the generosity of God, the commitment of God, they are people who live with this inexpressible joy and full of glory. What a wonderful truth. That's what real joy is, living in the presence of God. 
Joy is found when we set our affections upon him. When we set our affections upon this one uh, who, who loves us and who we know. I want you to notice a story. Uh, this is a wonderful story about somebody uh, I think he's a good example of this. This is a story about Zacchaeus. Um, if you turn uh, in your Bibles to Luke uh, chapter 19, we see an example of somebody who was seeking, uh, seeking after God, seeking after the presence of God in his life. That's, that's, who, that's where he set his affections. Look in Luke 19 and see this little story. It's a great story. I want you to notice something about how how he responds to God. Look in Luke 19 uh, and verses five and six. This is a great story. Jesus entered and passed through Jericho, it says, verse one. Now there was a man named Zacchaeus who was a chief tax collector and he was rich, he was loaded. Uh, You know, I, I was thinking about people who are rich. I don't know if you saw, um, on the, the, the advertisements and the shorts uh, recently, um, we're reminded that wealth does not make us happy. Very profound truth coming out of the lips of somebody who should have known if anybody knew that wealth was going to make him happy. But no, wealth doesn't make us happy. Zacchaeus was really rich, but he wasn't happy, and he sought to see Jesus. But he couldn't because of the crowd for... He was short, a little bloke. And so he ran ahead and he climbed up a sycamore tree to see Jesus, for he was going to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and he saw him and he said, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down, for today I must stay at your house. What an amazing thing that Jesus saw Zacchaeus and said, I want to come and stay with you, Zacchaeus. And so he made haste, he came down the tree, and he received him joyfully. With great joy, he received the Lord Jesus. And when they saw it, they all complained. And they said, he's gone to be guest in a man who's a rat bag, who's a sinner, who's a real scumbag, somebody who's a cheat and, you know, whatever else, tax collector. So Zacchaeus Uh, He stood and he says to the Lord, Lord, I give half my goods to the poor and if I've taken anything from anyone by false accusation, I restore it fourfold. And Jesus said to him, today salvation has come to this house uh, and, and he also, because he also is a son of Abraham. For the son of man has come to seek and say that which is lost. He was a rich man, but he was bankrupt. But he ran into the generosity of Jesus. And what did he do when he was confronted with the generosity of Jesus? He responded ruthlessly, abandoning everything else that mattered to him in life and offered to give away his wealth and his riches. And that's a a picture of the response. You know, when we we started... uh, uh, after, after we, we, when we were praying, that verse in 2 Corinthians 8 and verse 9, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that you through his poverty might be made rich. What's the response of that? The response of the generosity of God is to well up with joy and to, and to just want to, to to give it all away and abandon everything. Joy is found when we put our affections and we set our affections in Jesus and in Jesus alone. In Colossians 3 and verses 1 uh, to, to 3, it says this. It says, if you're raised with Christ, then it says, set your affections on the things that are above If Jesus has lifted you up and given you his resurrection life and made you a new creature, then you should set your affections on the things that are above, not on the things that are below. For you died, it says, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. 
And, and that's, that's our response. Our response is, is to abandon all things, uh, to, to, to basically, and this is where joy is found. It's, it's, it's bound when we set our affections uh, and the things of God. There's a story about um, another person who's wealthy, another person who's rich in the scriptures. It tells us, um, it tells us about a rich young ruler. But there's a, a principle. The principle in God's word is where our treasure is. Where our treasure is, that's where our heart will be. The things that matter to you, the things that you value, they are the things that you will focus on. They are the things that you will think about. Jesus said this, he said, don't lay up for yourselves the things uh, on earth, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust corrupts nor where thieves break through and steal. There's a great picture of this in the New Testament, in, Lou, in uh, Matthew uh, 19, where there's a rich young ruler that comes to Jesus. And he comes to Jesus, and it's an interesting story, because he comes to Jesus and he says, it says this young man came to him and it says, he, he said, good master, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? You know the story? Rich young ruler. And the rich young ruler comes uh, and he seeks Jesus, and he asks him, uh, what good thing can I do? Now, he, he had his theology wrong because we know that you can't do anything good enough to, to appease a holy God. It's, it's a waste of time. And Jesus recognizes you're on the wrong tram, mate. You think you're going to do a good thing in order that you can have eternal life? You'll have to be perfect because God is perfect. God is too pure to let anything corrupt enter into his presence. So, you know, you can't get into the presence of God. What good thing can you do? It's a lost cause, mate. What good thing shall I do? And he says, why do you... And Jesus tries to correct him. So he says, why, why do you call me good? There's none good but one, that's God. None good but one, that is God. Um, but if, if you will be perfect, he says... Uh, if, if you want to enter into life, he says, keep the commandments. And the young man says to Jesus, uh, he says, which ones? And if you look in the story, Jesus goes through the Ten Commandments. And you think, okay, this will get him. You know, you've you got to lie. You, you can't lie. You've got, you got to be free of lying. Oh, this will get him. You've got to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul. This will get him. You've got to obey your parents. This will get And he goes through the Ten Commandments. And, of course, what the Ten Commandments are designed to do, they are, they are, a, they are a solution to sin. They're, they're, not a, they're not a solution to sin, the Ten Commandments. They are a diagnostic tool. The Ten Commandments have no greater hope of saving your eternal soul than an x-ray machine has of curing you of cancer. But oh, how valuable that x-ray machine is when it diagnoses our need and helps us see how, how desperately ill we are and what needs to be done to fix it. That's what the Ten Commandments do. They're to show us that our heart is broken. So this rich young ruler comes uh, to Jesus and Jesus goes through the commandments with him and says, <clears throat> and he says, um, go, goes through them, and, and he says, well, which ones do, do I have to keep? And Jesus goes through all of them, and he says, all these things I've kept from my youth up, what do I still lack? And Jesus thinks, boy, I don't know how thick you can be. He says, you're not getting the point. But he looks into his heart, and he sees his affections are set on the things of this world. And so what does he say to the rich young ruler? He says to the rich young ruler, he says, one thing you lack, go and sell what you have and give it to the poor and you'll have treasure in heaven. And it says the young man went away sorrowful. He went away heartbroken because he realized that this was too tough a choice. 
I, I love things. I love this world. My affections are set on those things, and I'm not prepared to let them go. And when Jesus talks to the disciples about this, and he lets them, lets them know what's actually been going on, uh, he, he, uh, and explains this to them, he, they say to him, well, how can this possibly be? You know, you've got to go and sell everything. And he says, listen, it's easier for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than it is for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. This stronghold of materialism. You know, we are one of the richest societies on earth, and it's a curse. It's, that's why it's so hard for people in Australia, for people in the affluent West, to, to be serious about the things of God, because we've got too much to give up, too many other things that are going to fulfill us. And Jesus says it's easier for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God because we are so seduced, so captivated by things. That's where our hearts focus all the time. Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth where moth and rust corrupts and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasure in heaven where neither moth nor rust corrupts nor where thieves break through and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And our hearts and our thinking are all the time drawn after this world. And, G and the scriptures say, set your affections on the things above. That's where joy is. That's where joy is found. And, and Peter says, well, we've, we've sold everything. We've given up everything for you. And uh, and and. Jesus says to him, and he says, what about us? And he says, everyone who's forsaken houses or brethren or sisters or father or mother for my sake and for the gospels of the kingdom shall receive an hundredfold in this life and in the, in the life to come, eternal life. You don't, you don't secure eternal blessing and you don't secure joy by legalistically giving. You secure joy by readjusting your value system, by investing in the things that matter, by setting your affections on the things that count. And that is for us to do. And that is why the scriptures are so clear when they, they, they bring us this incredible challenge. You know, if we look in the early church, uh, and I've got a, a passage here that we should look at, the joy of the first disciples. I want you to notice something in the book of Acts. Look at what it looked like when we put legs on it and we see what the early church was like. In Acts chapter 2, notice, uh, notice their priorities, notice their values, notice what made them tick, notice where their hearts were. In, in um, Acts 2, and look at this, verse 44, pick it up in verse 44, it says this, all who believed were together and they had all things in common and they sold their possessions and their goods and they divided them uh, all among all as anyone had need. That's incredible. Things didn't matter to them. They, were, they lived a generous life. They reflected and mirrored the generosity of God. You know, when God sowed generously, when God sowed bountifully in sending the Lord Jesus, when he says he that sows bountifully reaps also bountifully, God is speaking about himself because he has actually ransomed and redeemed a people, billions of people, who are conformed to the image of his son, whom he foreknew he predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. He gave up his one son, his one and only begotten son. But he has received billions of Jesuses, bringing many sons to glory. He says, for which cause I'm not ashamed to call on my brothers 
We, brothers and sisters, are the bounty that God has received, the bountiful harvest that he's received from the corn of wheat that fell into the ground and died when he gave his son. Jesus said, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, abides alone. But if it die, it brings forth much fruit. God has received a great harvest and a great return for the investment of his son. And you know, there's a a passage of scripture which is a little bit uh, controversial. In in Ephesians 1, it says, The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. And many people think, oh, that's our inheritance in Christ, but it's actually God's inheritance in the saints. God counts you and me to be a rich and glorious inheritance. He that sows bountifully will reap also bountifully. You bet your bottom dollar, God is not gypped. He receives to himself a bountiful return on what he has given. And you and I, brothers and sisters, we are called to reflect and to mirror the same generosity, the generosity of God. And we mirror and pass on the generosity of God and multiply the generosity of God. If you look in 2 Corinthians 8, that verse we began with when I prayed, It says, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that you through his poverty might be made rich. A little bit earlier in introducing that verse, I want you to notice what he says in verses uh, 1 through to 5 of that chapter. He says, I bear bear witness that according to their ability, yes, and beyond their ability, they were freely willing, imploring us with much urgency that we would receive the gift and the fellowship uh, of the ministering to the saints. They were, when Paul got to these Corinthians, you know, they were pleading with him. No, 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 you've got to take our gift. They were pleading with him desperate for him to receive the gift. But listen to what he says, apart from this incredible generosity, the generosity of God, these people were living in the light of the generosity of God. They were people who were invested not in this earth, not in the things below, but they were invested in the things above. And it says this, he says in in verse five, not only as we had hoped, but they first gave themselves to the Lord. And then by God's will, they gave themselves to us. See, generosity of God is reciprocated. God receives it back from us. That's his desire. When we are living in in the fulfillment of what he came to do, are you living in the light of the generosity of God? Or is your affection set on what, what... you can use to gratify yourself in life? Or do you see yourself as an extension of the giving and the generosity of God? And we give ourselves to him. So joy comes, joy comes when we readjust our affections. And this is why I think it's really important for us to get practical. You know, your giving to the Lord is an opportunity for you to recalibrate where you set your heart. It's an opportunity for you to do an audit on what the things are that you are really invested in, to do an audit of what matters to you. And if you want to be living a life that Uh, in the light of the generosity of God, if you want to be living a life of joy, then you will be mirroring the generosity of God yourself. And you'll give yourself to him. And then you'll give yourself to others. And I want us to take a little bit of time as we come to close. And I'd ask those that are, uh, if the musicians can come come up, we're going to finish now. But I, I just want to challenge you about this lifestyle of generosity, a lifestyle of joy. And we need God to do a work in our hearts. We need God to make real for us an experience of his generosity. 
Perhaps you're here today as a Christian. And you, as you survey your heart, you say, Jeff, I don't have any joy. And the reason I don't have any joy is because my affections are set not on God. They are set on my circumstances. They are set on me fulfilling my ambitions. God is calling you today to come and to lay yourself at his feet. Because the scripture tells us, it, it tells us in, in Matthew 16, it says, what shall a man profit if he gains the whole world but, a, but, but loses his soul? And so he calls us to the cross. He says, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross. And that means abandoning all the ambitions in life a person who takes up his cross isn't worried about what his superannuation account is like. A person who takes up his cross isn't worried about what his house is, house is worth. A person who takes up his cross isn't worried about how much money he's making uh, in his job. A person who's taking up his cross isn't looking for promotion. And Jesus said, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross. That's the path of joy, setting our affections on the things above, uh, giving ourselves to him so that we can be the repository of his generosity, of his fullness, and experience the fullness of his joy. And perhaps you're here today and you don't know the Lord. It's not a very good gospel appeal to say, come to the Lord and give up all your money. There are people who did it. And that's not the deal. But here's the deal. You need to come to Jesus and be willing to give up not just your money, but everything else that matters. So that he may be able to recalibrate you. So you may find in him the reason for being. That you'll prove that God himself is enough. Let's come and let's pray. Father, we ask in Jesus' name, Lord, that you would speak into our hearts. Father, I pray for all of us here today. Lord, where, where, has, where has our heart been seduced? Where is it, Lord, that we've lost the plot? Where is it, Lord, that we're no longer surrendering ourselves to the goodness and the fullness of, of your grace and generosity? And Lord, we want to come and we want to ask you to free us, Lord, from the bondage of selfishness. Free us, Lord, from the bondage of the flesh of wanting to gratify our ambition. Free us, Lord, from the stronghold that the world has on us. Lord, as your people, we pray that you'd fill us with the same spirit of generosity, Lord Jesus, you had in giving yourself so completely for our redemption. Oh, Father, if there are any here today and there may very well be, you're, you're sitting here and you don't know the Lord. You've never responded to his grace. You've never responded to the generosity that he's given. But it's a deal that you won't receive the fullness of what he has unless you let go of the emptiness of what you're holding on to. And while our heads are bowed, while we're praying, while, while no one's looking around, no one knows what's going on in the secret place in your heart, but you need to do business with God. Christian, you need to do business with God. You who don't know the Lord yet, you need to do business with God. You need to come to him who was willing to give all that he had for you. Lord, we surrender ourselves to you. There is nothing else that we can do but present ourselves to you and ask you to fill us and inhabit us and take away, Lord, all of the selfish ambition and fill us, Lord, with the joy of knowing you that we might serve you with a newness of life in Jesus' name. Amen.